Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching on. He has sounded forth the trumpet that shall never call retreat. He is sifting out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. Oh, be swift, my soul, to answer him. Be jubilant, my feet. Our God is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching on. Christ was born across the sea with the glory in his bosom that transfigures you and me as he died to make men holy let us live to make men free while God is marching on glory glory Hallelujah, glory, glory, hallelujah, glory, glory, hallelujah, his truth is marching on, he is coming like the glory of the morning on the wave, he is wisdom to the mighty, he is honor to the brave. So the world shall be his footstool and the soul of wrong his slave. Our God is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching on. Oh, or spacious skies or amber waves of gray or purple mountain majesties above the fruited plain America America God shed his grace on thee and crown Shining sea and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. Well, thank you, thank you, Jay, and the brass quartet here. You guys really blessed us with that. We have one more here. Uh, one more patriotic song. We're actually going to sing the full version of God Bless America. I guess it was uh, written in 1918, but they didn't, uh, it didn't really get released until 1938. But anyway, Jay found this and uh, is going to bless us here with us this morning. The storm clouds gather far across the sea. Let us swear allegiance to a land that's free. Let us all be grateful for a land so fair. As we raise our voices in a solemn prayer, God bless. 
bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with light from above. From the mountains to the prairies to the oceans wide with foam. God bless America, my home, sweet home. God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above from the mountains to the prairies to the oceans wide with foam God's America my home sweet home God bless America my home Thank you, gentlemen. Sure appreciate you guys blessing us with that this morning. Wasn't that great, you guys? Let's give it up for them one more time here. Thank you guys so much. Amen. What a, what a great weekend here. We get to celebrate our, our country's independence and freedom. And, uh, and today we're going to celebrate the freedom that we have found in Christ. Amen. That only he can bring here. Let me just open us up in prayer. Father God, we just welcome you here in this place today. Lord, we thank you for our freedom. Thank you, Lord, all throughout the New Testament, God, it, there, it talks about us being set free in you, Lord. We just thank you for that today. We thank you, God, our freedom is a, is a privilege, Lord. We know that many men and women have fought for our freedom here in this country, Lord. And Lord, we know that you died and gave the sacrifice, sacrificed it all for our freedom. Lord, we thank you for that today, Lord. We thank you that we can worship you, Lord. We thank you that we are, are now more than conquerors through you, Jesus. We thank you now. In Jesus' name, amen. When my hope and strength is gone, you are the one that calls me on. You are the life, you are the fight that's in my soul. Oh, your resurrection power burns like fire in my heart. When waters rise, I lift my eyes up to your throne. We are more than conquerors. Christ, you have overcome this world, this life. We will not bow to sin or to shame. We are defiant in your name. You are the fire that cannot be tamed. You are the power in our veins, our Lord, our God, our conqueror. I will sing into the night. Christ is risen and on high. Greater is he living in me than in the world. No surrender, no retreat. We are free, we are redeemed. We will declare over despair you are the hope. life we will not bow to sin or to shame 
We are defiant in your name. You are the fire that cannot be tamed. You are the power in our veins, our Lord. Our God, our conqueror. Nothing is impossible, every chain is breakable, with you we are victorious. You are stronger than our hearts, you are greater than the dark, with you we are victorious. Every chain is breakable with you. We are victorious. So oh, you are stronger than our hearts. You are greater than the dark with you. We are victorious. We are more than conquerors through Christ. this world, this life. We will not bow to sin or to shame. We are defiant in your name. You are the fire that cannot be tamed. You are the power in our veins, our Lord, our God. We are more than conquerors through Christ. Overcome this world, this life. We will not bow to sin or to shame. We are defiant in your name. You are the fire that cannot be tamed. You are the power in our veins, our Lord, our God, our conqueror. sorrow and dead in my sin lost without hope no place to begin your love made a way to let mercy come in when death was arrested my life began the ash was redeemed only beauty remains my orphan heart was given a name my morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested, my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new, now life begins with you. It's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new, now life begins with you. Release from my chains, I'm a prisoner no more. My shame is ransom, he faithfully bore. He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. When death was arrested, my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new, now life begins with you. made us new now life begins 
Darkness rejoiced as so though heaven had lost. But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested and my life began. That's when death was arrested and my life began. So free washes over me. You have made me new now. Life begins with you. It's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new now. Life begins with you oh we're free free forever we're free come join the song of all the redeemed yes we're free free forever amen when death was arrested and my life began oh we're free free forever we're free Come join the song of all the redeemed. Yes, we're free, free forever, amen. When death was arrested, my life began. When death was arrested, my life began. That's when death was arrested, my life began. This time we're going to have uh, communion. I believe Pastor Kevin is uh, coming up here, I believe. You guys have heard about signs and wonders, right? <laughs> They're giving me signs and I'm wondering <laughs> what's going on. So, um, so anyway, let me, let me uh, pray over us here real quick. And then uh, I think, like I said, we're going to have communion time. Uh, Father God, we just thank you again, Lord, for the freedom that we have in you. Thank you, Lord God, for your, your, your love for us, God, your great love that you came all this way, Lord, to, to set us free, God, free, free from sin, free from hell, Lord, free from the bondage of this life, God. We just thank you, Lord, for the freedom that we find in you and the peace that we find in you today, Lord. We just thank you now. Lord, I pray over this uh, time we have together today, Lord, pray that you open our ears and our hearts to all that you have for us in this place today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Ch Chad, for covering for me. I yes, got distracted sure. back there in the back hall, and I apologize for that. Uh, just wanted to say good morning. My name is Kevin Clark. I'm the pastor here at Encompass Church, and as I think most of you know, this is the 4th of July or Independence Day weekend, and we're celebrating our nation's freedom. But this morning, we're actually celebrating an even greater freedom along with that. It is appropriate that this holiday weekend fall, uh, coincides with a communion Sunday. And on Communion Sundays, we recognize the freedom that we have because of the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made for us when he went to the cross to pay for your sin and for my sin. On the night before he was crucified, he invited his disciples to an upper room in a part of Jerusalem in a private home to celebrate the annual Passover event. And while he was there, he explained that his death was imminent. Following his explicit instructions from that evening, Christians around the world have reenacted that final night with Jesus' disciples in the celebration of the Lord's Supper or communion. 
If you have not picked up a communion cup uh, with the wafer in it, they are available on the tables at the back, and you're welcome to make your way to the back and pick one up. During the meal, Jesus held up two elements. He held up bread, and he held up a cup. And both of those elements were familiar to Jews uh, in their day-to-day life, as well as familiar and, in- and essential elements for the Passover celebration. And as Jesus held them up in the course of sharing the traditions of the Passover meal, he said some words that were at one, uh, in one sense familiar, but in another sense very strange to his disciples. He said, this bread is my body, and it is given for you. He said, this cup is a covenant between God and his people. An extraordinary transaction was about to occur. Within just a few hours, the perfect, sinless Son of God would exchange his life for our freedom. Though no one else in the room understood at that moment, he would buy us freedom from sin and death and return us to the God who created us. And that is why we celebrate communion. We're going to take part in that meal that he had with his disciples symbolically in the next few moments. If you haven't already peeled off the cellophane and the foil at the top, you are welcome to do that now as we start this Passover celebration, this Last Supper celebration. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 and 24, the Apostle Paul said this, For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat the bread together. Paul continues in verse 25 by saying, In the same way, he, Jesus, took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. Let's drink together. And Paul wraps up that discussion of the Last Supper with verse 26. He says, for every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. That's what we do on Sundays like this one. We remind ourselves and all those who witness this that the Lord Jesus died for our sins. He rose again, and he opened the door for us to have a relationship with God the Father through him. Would you bow your heads with me? Father God, we are ever grateful for freedom. Most of the time, we think of freedom in terms of the physical and intellectual ability to express and practice what we want. But Lord, the greater freedom we recognize today that spiritual freedom from sin and death. We are ever eternally grateful that your son, Jesus Christ, made it possible for us to have freedom from those things. Bless us, Lord, as we put our faith in him and we trust in what he has offered to us. May the celebration of that gift permeate all that we do this weekend. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
We're very glad that you're here today. I'm going to ask you to go ahead and stand as you do. The kids are free to make their way to the back. Uh, they'll head off to Children's Church. And the rest of you, uh, shake hands with somebody nearby that you haven't said hello to yet and welcome them here. Good morning, Encompass Church. Welcome in Compass Church. It's good to have everybody here this morning, and uh, we hope this is a great start to your 4th of July weekend. Everybody excited for the 4th of July? Yeah, good. We should be even more excited about being here this morning, amen? Yeah, so this is good, and uh, we want to welcome those. By the way, I'm Stuart Stanton, one of the elders here at Encompass, and just a few announcements this morning. We want to welcome those who are new to the church or even those who've been here a long time. Uh, we want you to connect with us by filling out a connect card. If you have questions, concerns, prayer requests, whatever it might be, you can get in touch with us by using that connect card. And it's in your, uh, you can just hand it 
uh, the paper one is in the welcome guide, and you can just uh, fill that out and put it in the in the baskets in the back or at any of the exits, and we will get that information and then contact you. Uh, or you can do the QR code thing. You can uh, scan that and get to us, or you can go to encompass.church and the contact us uh, area there, and we can get it that way as well. So really, a number of different ways that you can get a hold of us. You can even call the church office if you want to, 303-841-CARE, and uh, we will, and by the way, if it's your first time filling out a Connect card, we'll give you a gift card in return for, for doing that. So thank you for participating that way. And if you are a guest and you want to learn a little bit more about the church, what we do, what we're trying to accomplish here, our, our mission, our vision, then uh, you can go right upstairs after the service at 1045. It's uh, in this enclosed area right above the auditorium. And you can participate in the goodies that they have there and get to meet Pastor Kevin and some of the other leaders in our church. You'll be able to understand through a four-week process of what we're trying to accomplish here. So you get to know right away whether this is a fit for you or not. It's very valuable. And um, you don't have to go to all four sessions. You can go to one and you can just get the other ones randomly, I guess, if you wanted to. But uh, we want to encourage you to go there. There's plenty of opportunity for your children, students, or younger ones to be involved during that time as well. So take advantage of that, and that's at 1045, right after the service. We have the women's seminar that's coming up on July 16th. That's at 9 o'clock from 9 till noon, and there is a, a suggested fee, a donation of $10. You're going to hear Deborah Burton talk about um, basically the, the message is the choice that changed her life, the choice that changed her life. So these are sitting in some of the chairs here in the auditorium. And if you want to register for that, you can go to, uh, you can go, uh, you can, well, actually, you can scan the QR code on this. You can call the church office or Jan's actually going to be, Jan, the head of women's ministries, Jan Stanton will be right outside the auditorium after the service at a table there, and you can talk to her about registering for that event as well. So that's uh, the women's seminar. There will be scrumptious food by Lynn Miller and her team, and Deborah's going to present another smashing success of a seminar for you. So uh, that's coming up pretty quick, July 16th from 9 a.m. To, to noon. Then we have the incredible race, the VBS from July 18th to the 22nd, from 9 to noon. And we need still a few volunteers, a few adult volunteers to participate in that. So if you can do that. Um, and I, we're, we have a barbecue, and it, uh, it's not unlike a show that the kids will do at the very end uh, at that barbecue on Friday the 22nd. So if you can participate in that, or if you can be a volunteer for the rest of the week, uh, contact uh, Joy Hummel, and she'll be more than happy to place you in a place where uh, you're going to be used. But that should be an exciting time. We, uh, it's, it's very labor intensive, but it's very honoring to God to do this, and our community can be reached in a huge way by doing this VBS. So we also do need neckties for the men, or from the men, not for the men. Uh, they're going to use them for their activity, for their crafts. And so if you've got uh, some dusty neckties lying around, then please bring those in, uh, give them to the church office, and that way the kids can use those, put them to good use. And if they're just sitting in your closet not being used, that's a good way to, to declutter and let the kids use it for something good. All right. And so... Let's go to the Lord and ask his blessing upon our giving this morning. We do want to thank you for how you've given over the past several years. This church uh, is sustained by you, and God uses you to do it, so let's, uh, let's ask him to continue to do so. Father, we know that we are blessed above and beyond what we deserve. We're grateful that we can come into this house of worship and celebrate freely. We pray that uh, as we give our gifts this morning or online or however we do it, we, we thank you that we have a number of different ways we can, we can give to you. And we thank you that this church is, is one that seeks to honor you through 
what we do with the monies that come in. We thank you that this church is debt free and has been for a long time so that we can minister to you more freely and uh, less uh, encumbered. And Father, we pray that uh, even when we think about the gifts that come in this morning and, and how we use much of those for the benevolent fund, for those who are, are in a, a pickle in one way or another, those who have needs, those who have concerns that they just didn't see coming or they just can't seem to get out of. We thank you that so many have invested uh, and, and freely given so that we might be able to help those in our church and some in our community who have these needs and uh, they can see that, that we're there to help them uh, and we go beyond these walls to help them do so. Father, as we think about the remainder of this worship service, we do thank you that we live in a country that's free to celebrate you. We thank you that we have a freedom in Christ that we couldn't have otherwise. When we think of the, the lives that we had before Christ, we were enslaved to sin. And now we're free to serve you. We're free to be your children, to be your ambassadors. We're free to um, follow your love and your grace, your goodness. And we thank you that uh, we can celebrate that here this morning. We can worship you this morning and, and be ecstatic about whose we are and what you're doing in our lives. When I think of the world and what they have, it doesn't, and it, there's no hope at the very end. There's just no hope. There's no, they just, um, it's like Groundhog Day, doing the same thing day in and day out. And, and we don't live life that way. We live life with a purpose beyond what this world can offer. We see an eternity with you and a perfection with you as a result. And uh, we couldn't be in better hands. We thank you for your care for us, your love for us. And again, we thank you for setting us free from the law of sin and death that we might serve you. And we pray for Kevin this morning as he gives his message that you would help us to apply it, to hear it, to apply it, to uh, use it, to equip us for the, uh, the events that take place this very week. We give it all to you, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, you actually taught me something I don't think I knew. Um, I never realized that the last four numbers of our phone numbers spell out care. <laughs> How long have I been the pastor here? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Welcome again. Uh, as you know, this is Fourth of July weekend. I know that many of you uh, will have tomorrow off from work. Uh, some of you will probably go to the mountains or to one of the local lakes or you might barbecue, uh, you might go and watch a fireworks display uh, tomorrow evening. And along the way, uh, we might forget that the freedom that we celebrate tomorrow <clears throat> was provided to us at a cost. We enjoy the freedoms that we have because men and women gave their time, their resources, and in some cases, even their lives to provide it and to maintain it. And while it's never appropriate in the church to elevate any ideal, even freedom, to the same or a higher level than the worship of Jesus Christ, it is appropriate for us to honor those who have helped to maintain or uh, protect our freedom. And so I'd like if you are a member, uh, you uh, work for any level of government, local, state, or federal, or the military, would you stand so we can honor you with applause? Thank you to those of you who have served, who continue to serve, to make it possible for us to enjoy the freedom to be here and to worship the way that we worship. So tomorrow we celebrate our freedom in the physical and intellectual sense. We celebrate the ability to express and to practice those things that we believe are right. But today I wanna to talk about freedom in the spiritual sense freedom from the slavery into which every one of us is born, regardless of our nationality, our class, 
our ethnicity, or our gender. And I want to talk also about our natural tendency, even when we have experienced that spiritual freedom, to try to go back to the slavery that we had before. I want to talk about how we turn away from that tendency to return to slavery and find freedom restored. In the book of Galatians, in chapter 5, verse 1, the Apostle Paul wrote this, So Christ has truly set us free. Now make sure that you stay free and don't get tied up again in slavery to the law. From what has Christ set us free? From sin and death. How did he set us free? He set us free by living a perfect, sinless life and dying on a cross to pay the penalty for our sin and rising again to show he has defeated death. And he offers freedom to us from sin and death if we put our faith in what he's done, not we, what, we, what we can do to save us from the rightful consequences of our sin. Throughout all of the letters that Paul wrote in the New Testament, one theme resonates over and over again. Paul says what Jesus has done is enough. He has truly set us free. Not partially, not conditionally. Salvation is not dependent in any way on what you and I do because Jesus did it all. But some in this era and some in Paul's era disagreed with him. And five years ago, almost to the day, I think it was uh, July the 3rd, not the 2nd, or rather July the 2nd, not the 3rd, I shared a, a similar message to this with those of you who were here way back then. And as I look at the, the way the world is functioning now, and even the way the Christian world tends to function in a lot of situations, I think it's time that we should revisit this idea for one week. So if you have a Bible, turn to the book of Galatians. And today, um, I'm going to deviate from my norm. I'm going to use the New Living Translation. Why? Because the New Living Translation was designed to speak in the plainest, most modern-day English that a person of this era would understand. Now, sometimes we tend to not use some of those plain modern-day English translations because they may miss some nuances and may not be as literal as we would like them to be in terms of their translation. But in this case, in the passages I'm going to read today, what you will hear is like having a conversation with a very blunt friend who does not pull any punches. And that's what I want you to experience today. Now, the book of Galatians was written to a group of churches, not in one city, but in a large region across much of what is now part of modern-day Turkey. And some Christians in that Galatian region came to faith in Jesus Christ from pagan backgrounds, but many, maybe most of them, were coming to faith still from Jewish backgrounds. And regardless of the background, those people were embracing what Paul had taught, deciding to follow Jesus, and finding freedom from their unsuccessful attempts to live up to whichever religious system of laws they had followed prior to coming to Jesus. But after Paul left that region, a group of Jewish teachers came from Jerusalem and began teaching new converts that living by faith in Jesus Christ was not enough, that to be a true Christian, you also had to live according to the Old Testament mosaic laws. And when Paul heard that his believer friends were beginning to listen to these teachers, he became alarmed. And so he wrote the letter or the book of Galatians that's in your Bible primarily to counter this mistaken belief and teaching. And he gets right to the point early on in the letter. Look at Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. He says, I am shocked 
that you are turning away so soon from God, who called you to himself through the loving mercy of Christ. You are following a different way that pretends to be the good news, but is not the good news at all. You are being fooled by those who deliberately twist the truth concerning Christ. These teachers who came from Jerusalem to the region of Galatia, whom Paul referred to as Judaizers, uh, men trying to get people to act like Jews and follow Judaism, were telling the new believers that their faith in Jesus Christ was not enough for God, that to follow God, you had to also embrace Judaism with all of its practices and its laws. And the Galatian Christians, sadly, were tending to buy into this teaching. And so men who were not Jewish were being circumcised to follow the Old Testament law. And families, whether they had followed the law prior to coming to Christ or not, were beginning to more rigorously adhere to rules for ritual cleanliness and for food and for observing the Sabbath. And so Paul was totally frustrated. He could not understand why anyone would want to go back to the old ways and exchange freedom in Christ for bondage to the Old Testament law. Now, those of you who might have been here five years ago when I talked about this will remember a story I told about a woman who attended a church where I worked in San Diego. And she met and became enamored with a group called the Twelve Tribes, which uh, some people have referred to as a cult because of some of their practices. This week, from July 1st through the 7th, approximately 10,000 members of the Twelve Tribes are, from around the world are gathering in Craig, Colorado, in a park to celebrate their organization's 50th anniversary. On Tuesday night, my family and I stayed in a hotel in North Platte, Nebraska. And the next morning at breakfast, we saw two families that initially I didn't realize uh, who they were, but later I recognized as part of that group. Very large families speaking a, a Scandinavian language and gathered together uh, to head off presumably to this event. Now, how did I recognize them? They weren't wearing t-shirts that said 12 tribes. I recognized them because I've spent some time with some members of their group. And why I did that, I will explain in a moment. And you might wonder, what was my family doing in North Platte, Nebraska? Well, we were adding this little creature to our family. Where is Vicki? There's Vicki. On the Sunday I was hired, called to this church, um, I was grilled that afternoon. People asked lots of theological questions and ministry practice questions. And at the end, when they said, are there any more questions, Vicki raised her hand and said, do you have a dog? And I had to say no, and we have not for many, many years. And I think that was a problem. <laughs> because Vicki has evangelized me to dog ownership for five years, and your evangelism has borne fruit. <laughs> now, my friend at the church where I was the pastor, who was considering, uh, she was considering joining the 12 tribes, and she met them at a farmer's market. Uh, they go to farmer's markets regularly. They live in communes. There was one outside of San Diego. That group traveled in a bus that looked a little bit like this one. They go to the farmer's markets. They sell their homegrown produce and their tea, and they have conversations with people, and they invite those people to join them. And to my friend, their description of their lifestyle felt so accurate to the New Testament idea that she wanted to check them out, and she was seriously considering joining them. She learned that everyone who joins sells all their belongings and the money goes to the community to help it. They live together in very large houses, often with several families under one roof. They worship together every day. Um, they eat meals together. They work on farms or in tea shops or restaurants that are owned by the organization. Many of those tea shops and restaurants are called Yellow Delis. There is one in Boulder. If you have been there, you might have had the opportunity to eat there. And uh, they carefully observe many Old Testament laws. 
My friend spent one weekend at the local commune, and then she made an appointment with me to talk to me about their beliefs and her desire to join them. And I had very few facts, to be quite honest, and I'd read a few uh, somewhat alarming articles by people who have left the group. I'd read those online, but my arguments didn't dissuade her, and she ended up saying, you don't really know what they believe, and so it is not fair for you to judge them. And so out of concern for her, I made an appointment to go to their tea shop in San Diego and visit with their leaders. So one week later, I found myself in rural San Diego having lunch at a tea shop with David and Jacob. We would pronounce their names David and Jacob, but they lean towards Hebrew pronunciations. The men ha all had very thick, long, untrimmed beards in keeping with Old Testament law. They all wore their hair long, uh, but tied up. The women wore long homemade dresses, uh, head scarves, and wore no makeup. They served food that was homegrown and kosher. And after we ate lunch and had tea, we talked theology. And the two men began by introducing themselves as a former Baptist senior pastor and a former mainline denomination youth pastor, and I quickly discovered that they knew their Bibles pretty well. Now, visiting groups like this is not my normal practice. I went because I cared a lot about my friend, and I wanted to know the truth about their beliefs and what they did. And so when I went, I had people praying, and I told them specifically to give me ask God to give me discernment about what I heard and also to expect me back at a certain time. Now, our conversation covered a lot of topics, but uh, very quickly drifted to the arena that I wanted to talk to about the most, and that is, why did they believe that most Christians are wrong about salvation? So I asked, what do you believe a person must do to be saved from his sin? Do you believe that she must acknowledge her sin, repent and turn from it, uh, believe Jesus died on the cross to pay for that sin and receive him by faith as Lord and Savior. One of the men said, yes, but that's not all. You also must keep the law. And I asked, which law? And they said, the Old Testament law. That's why we eat and dress and live like we do. To be a true Christian you must follow it. Now, the teachers in the Galatian churches were teaching exactly the same thing. They would have admitted, yes, you need to have your faith in Jesus Christ, but they would have added, in order to truly be a follower who has been made right with God, you must also follow the practices and laws of Moses. But the Apostle Paul disagreed strongly. Look at Galatians chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. He said, you and I are Jews by birth, not sinners like the Gentiles. Yet we know that a person is made right with God by faith in Jesus Christ, not by obeying the law. And we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we might be made right with God because of our faith in in Christ, not because we have obeyed the law. For no one will ever be made right with God by obeying the law. What is the gist of that? We have to remember every day of our lives, no one is ever made right with God by obeying the law. Now, Paul wasn't talking about the laws of the nation that you live in. Paul was talking about God's law, a religious law. And when we hear him say that, there's something that clicks in our brain sometimes, and we think, that doesn't feel right. If it's God's law, why wouldn't obeying it make us right with him? Paul said, most of you are Jews by birth. He knew this, this group of churches. He knew many of the people who had become Christians there. He said, most of you are Jews by birth, not sinners like the Gentiles. 
Paul wasn't saying that he thought Jews were not sinners. He was saying sinners is the term we use for Gentiles. We tend to think that we are better than them because we are the people chosen by God, the ones who were given his law. But then he says, yet we know that obeying the law does not make us right with God. It doesn't save us. Faith in what Jesus has done saves us. That's the only thing that can make us right with God. Being a good person, following external rules handed down by an authority or our culture or even internal rules that we create in our own heads don't do anything to save us. Why? In the middle of that conversation with those two men, I read this passage from Galatians. Now, I'd prepared ahead of time, um, and so I sort of knew what we were in disagreement about, and so I had spent some time reading and reflecting on Galatians before I went. And when I read that passage to those two leaders, they immediately fired back and said, then what would you say is the point of the law if it doesn't make us right with God and it's not something to be followed today like it was in the Old Testament? Paul ex apparently expected the same question from the Galatian teachers because he asks it and he answers it. Look at Galatians chapter 3, verse 19. Why then was the law given? It was given alongside the promise to show people their sins. But the law was designed to last only until the coming of the child who was promised. We have to remember something about God's rules, God's laws. The law can only show us our sin. It cannot save us from it. Paul says the Old Testament law was given to the Jews for a specific reason, to show people, not just them, but all people around the world, what sin is, to help us see that we all are sinful. All of us are hopelessly full of sin. What does that mean? What, does, what was Paul trying to communicate there? You and I don't know we are sinful until someone or something tells us that we have sinned. And the only way to tell someone they've done something wrong is to show them what the right choice would have been in the same situation. And that's what the law in the Old Testament did for the Jews and did for us. Now, in San Diego County, where we lived uh, up until five years ago, it is illegal because of light pollution and observatories in the local hills that they call mountains. It is illegal to use outside Christmas lights for more than 60 days in any 12-month period. And if you have them illuminated, you must turn them off at 11 p.m. and they must stay off until sunrise. Have I broken that law? Oh yeah. <laughs> Did I know I was breaking that law? Not until this week when I Googled San Diego and strange laws. Now, that's, a, that's kind of a silly example, but the truth is that none of us know we're doing anything sinful until someone or something says, that's wrong, and here's why. Now, that someone may be a person, or that something may be a culture that we grew up in, or it might be something like an explicit legal code that we find in the Old Testament. Now, you and I might argue that knowledge of right or wrong is hardwired into us, and especially uh, we know we've done something wrong if we hurt someone. Is that completely true? I want you to think back, those of you especially who have kids, 
to when your child was approximately one year old. If you put your child and one other child in a room with only one toy, and one child had the toy, the other one's going to do what? Take it away. The other one's going to see the hurt reaction, the screaming, the tears, the fighting, and yet the other one is still going to genuinely think, this is mine, this is right for me. Those children do not understand that to take something that is not yours is wrong until another outside source, an adult, a parent, or a teacher says, that is wrong, and here's what you should have done instead. The same is true for all of us. We're being fed those signals about what is sin from very early on. And what we know now, that reaction we have when we hurt someone is based on what we've learned over time. We had to be told, according to Paul, that we sinned. Now, the Old Testament law was given as a set of standards to show what's right. And what, what's right is the set of decisions that aligns with God's character, that operates the way that God would operate if he was us. And I've heard people say sometimes that, well, you know, the Old Testament law, any religious law, is really just a random set of rules. Uh, you argue that it came from God, but it could just as easily have been all of those laws could have been reversed, and we'd have to obey the reverse of those. But that's actually impossible because the Old Testament law defines what is perfect, loving, good, and just, and what God says is right. And if they were all flipped to the opposite and God said that was right, we would have a God who was imperfect, unloving, unjust, and evil. But the law isn't given just to show us God's character. It isn't given just to show us what is sin. The law is given to show us how hard or how impossible it is for us to live up to God's standards. In order for any human being to achieve that perfection that is needed to relate to God in a personal way and to avoid the consequences of sin, that person would have to follow the law perfectly from birth until the last breath. How hard is it for us to do that? Well, take the Ten Commandments, for instance, just as a short example. It's just one part of God's law. Sometimes it's broken up into two sections, and the first uh, four commandments have to do with our relationship with God. They include, have no other gods before me. Don't create any idols. Don't misuse my God's name. Remember the Sabbath. And the remaining six have to do with interaction with other people. They include honor your parents. And then five don'ts. Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't give false testimony. Don't covet. How many of us could say that we've kept one of those for our entire lives. Now, maybe you think you've kept the I will never covet law. The 10th commandment actually says this, you must not covet your neighbor's house, you must not covet your neighbor's wife, male or female servant, ox or donkey, or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. And we might say, you know, I don't covet anyone's house or spouse or help or animals, so I think I'm pretty good. But what about that anything else that belongs to your neighbor part? Have you ever wished you had his new truck or her fit figure or his peer respect or her well-behaved children or his still present hairline <laughs> or their active retirement or their social life. How many of us could say, I've never coveted? How about number nine? You must not testify falsely against your neighbor. Some of us might say, I think I've never done that. Um, and after all, testify, if you look up the Hebrew, is a word that can be used in legal contexts in a courtroom. So a lot of us would say, well, I would never lie under oath. 
But that's not the only place that that Hebrew word is used. It actually extends to any false testimony that could have a negative impact on your neighbor. Have you ever assumed you knew someone else's motives and told a third party what their motives were? Have you ever exaggerated the actions of another person in a way that cast false light on them? Now, you might say, I know I'm good on number eight. You must not steal. I've never stolen anything. I can't remember ever taking anything that didn't belong to me. Have you ever taken credit for something that you weren't personally and fully responsible for? Have you ever withheld something someone else needed that was in your power to give? Proverbs chapter 3, verse 27 says, Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is in your power to do it. When we do that, we are stealing. How about an easy one? Look at number seven. You must not commit adultery. That's pretty black and white, right? I mean, I think most of us in this room probably say, I have that one down. I can check that box off. We're pretty confident until we read what Jesus said about that. Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 and 28, Jesus said, You've heard the commandment that says you must not commit adultery. But I say, anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Shall we move on? <laughs> Many of us think, I don't see those kind of things you're describing as sin. Paul says, that's why the law was given. Every one of those commandments has a deeper spiritual application, and all of us have broken every single one of those commandments in one way or another. The law showed us that we were sinful, and we're stuck neck deep in it. Perfect sinlessness, which is God's standard, is completely and utterly impossible for us. None of us can keep the Ten Commandments, much less the other nearly 600 laws that are expressed in the Old Testament. So Paul was dumbfounded when he heard that Christians in Galatia were giving up their freedom in Jesus Christ to go back to a legalistic application of the law in order to earn being right with God. He said, why are you doing that? The law makes you slaves. Look at Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. He says, think of it this way. If a father dies and leaves an inheritance for his young children, those children are not much better off than slaves until they grow up. Even though they actually own everything their father had, they have to obey their guardians until they reach whatever age their father set. And that's the way it was with us before Christ came. We were like children. We were slaves to the basic spiritual principles of this world. So Paul compares living under the Old Testament law in slavery to being like a child who has to obey some intermediary guardian in order to please his master. He says, before Jesus came, we were slaves to the basic principles of the law. We were slaves to religious law, meaning we had to obey it all or face the consequences. And the only way to achieve freedom in those circumstances is to slavishly spend every moment of your life trying to adhere to the tiniest letter of the law. And any minor slip-up renders you imperfect and sinful from that moment forward. But with the law which showed us our sin came a promise that someone, a Messiah, would set us free from the slavery that that law created for us. 
Paul explains how that happened in Galatians 4, 4 through 7. But when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. And because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Abba, Father. Now you are no longer a slave, but God's own child. And since you are his child, God has made you his heir. So Paul says, when Jesus came to buy freedom for those of us who were slaves to the law, God could adopt us as his very own children. Jesus lived a sinless life. He followed the law. And he died to atone or to pay the penalty for all of us who were not able to follow the law. If we by faith believe and receive what he has done on our behalf, rather than trying to do that ourselves, then we are given the gift of salvation. And those who receive that gift of freedom receive God's spirit who enables us to relate to God like we would relate to a good father, to live for him. And we become his children, his heirs, people with an inheritance that are no longer slaves to the law. Now, growing up, like all of you, I can remember times when I was annoyed by my, that my parents got to make all the rules and I was just expected to obey them. I never got any say. I rarely had any influence at all in the rules that were made. Now, my parents were Christians. We, my sister and I knew that they loved us, but that didn't really make following the rules all that much easier. They often seemed unfair, and it often felt like I was a slave to the rules. I know, poor baby, right? <laughs> I remember getting some freedom at certain ages. When I was 12, that summer, the first day of the summer, I asked my mom, can I go ride my bike with my friends in the canyons near the house? And she said, yes, you can. Be back for dinner. And that was like 9 o'clock in the morning. I was like, woo, freedom. And I remember at 17, my dad taking me to buy my very first used car, a beat-up, rusty, mildewed on the inside, 1973 Monte Carlo. But man, that thing was freedom. I could go where I wanted, but every time I came home, I was reminded that what? I was still under parental law. It wasn't until I left for college that I really experienced freedom. I remember that first week in the dorm, lying in my dorm room bed, staring up at the bunk above me and thinking to myself, you know, I'm actually free now. I can stay in school and get a degree. I can decide to drop out and go get a job. I can go where I want, when I want. I can have relationships with whomever I want. I can live wherever I want and how I want. And parental law no longer applies as long as I can pay my own way. But because I am an adult, I have freedom. I could just up and walk out of here if I wanted to. And I never wanted to go back to the slavery of parental law. But in that moment, I also had this odd epiphany, and I remember this really clearly. I remember for the first time feeling grateful that that time in slavery to parental law taught me to appreciate the extraordinary nature of freedom. And I was actually grateful to the ones who gave me my freedom. I didn't actually earn that freedom. They paid an extraordinary price for 18 years to prepare me to live freely, to raise me to adulthood. And when they did, I inherited what they promised. Paul was shocked when he found out that the Galatian Christians had so easily accepted the teaching that they needed to follow the Jewish rules and to return to slavery. 
if they wanted to be right with God. He didn't understand that at all. He wondered why they'd want to go back to trying to earn the inheritance that had already been given to them. And so to his Jewish friends, he said, you tried this. You know it didn't work. You can't follow the law. You will never earn being right with God. And you might be sitting there thinking, okay, I get it. You've said it enough times, Kevin, but here's the reality. I am not tempted to follow the Old Testament law. I didn't grow up Jewish. I haven't joined a group like the 12 tribes. That's not even a slight enticement to me. And maybe you're right, but I would be willing to bet that every person in this room has created inside his or her own head a set of internal rules that you think makes you more right with God. To the Gentiles who were in that camp, Paul said this in Galatians 4, verses 8 through 12. Before you Gentiles knew God, you were slaves to so-called gods that do not even exist. So now that you know God, or should I say now that God knows you, why do you want to go back again and become slaves once more to the weak and useless spiritual principles of the world? You are trying to earn favor with God by observing certain days or months or seasons or years. I fear for you. Perhaps all my hard work with you was for nothing. Dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to live as I do in freedom from these things. For I have become like you Gentiles, free from those laws. Are you a slave to so-called gods that do not exist? to systems you have created in your head that you have pieced together both from scripture and from culture and from what feels right to you that you believe if you adhere to those things will make you more right with God. Do you ever feel right with God because you attend church regularly or because you give regularly or because you serve regularly? Do you ever feel right with God because you know more scripture now than you once did? Do you ever feel right with God because you pray a certain way? Do you ever feel right with God because you are a good citizen and you vote for the right people? Do you ever feel right with God because you believe you are good and moral and you treat most people pretty well. Do you know what Paul would say to that? I fear for you. Perhaps all my hard work with you was for nothing. None of those things will ever make you right with God. None of those things will ever counteract a single sin you have committed. In fact, our rules for goodness can't erase our sin. Only faith can do that. The only thing that will ever make you right with God is faith, complete dependence on what Jesus Christ has done to save you from your sin. Now, should we do or be those other things that I just mentioned? Yes, but they aren't going to change your status with God one iota. We should do those things out of gratitude for the God who made the change possible through Jesus Christ. Paul said, why, if you've experienced freedom that comes from knowing Jesus by faith, would you ever go back to slavery, to a system 
that you yourself know you can never live up to you. Not one person in this room can live up to the system you have in your head that tells you what a truly good person lives like. Why would you enslave yourself to something like that? Paul says, live what like I live. Put all your faith into Jesus. Stake your future with God, not on your ability to follow rules and live a good life, but on the fact that Jesus already did, and he bought your ticket. This weekend, when you are thanking God for freedom, thank him for the real freedom that he has made possible for you. Abandon those systems by which you evaluate yourself and you will find freedom restored. Would you bow your heads with me? Father God, I know that I personally am the most guilty of this in this room. You made me an engineering guy who creates a system of rules in his head and then evaluates himself by it every day. And Lord, I know that oftentimes I think I'm better because I follow the rules that are in my head. Some of those come from scripture, some do not. Lord, thank you for the reminder that none of those things are what make me right with you. And that really and truthfully, any dependence I place on those is dependence on something that will take me farther away from you. God, help me to put my faith entirely and fully in you moment by moment and help each person in this room to do the same. Thank you for freedom, Lord. Thank you for freedom in our nation, for freedom to worship as we please, for freedom to express and practice those things that we believe are right. Lord, more than that though, even if we had none of those things, we could thank you for freedom in Christ. So that's what we do today. We thank you in Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with us and we will sing our final song together. Well, I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me And I heard about his groaning Of his precious blood then I repented of my sin and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew. And all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing blood. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing. How he made the lame to walk again and cause the blind to see. Then I cried, dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he brought me with his redeeming love. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing blood.
built for me in glory. I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea, about the angels singing and the old redemption story. And some sweet day I'll sing of them the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him and all my love is due. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing blood. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Amen. Every once in a while, I forget I'm in Colorado. <laughs> and then we do Victory in Jesus by Banjo. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for being here with us today. We invite you, if you are new to the church, to come and check out Guest Reception. Uh, if you're not new or if you just want to go straight there, we have some adult Sunday groups. Uh, and we also have activities for youth and for children. So we'd love for you to stick around, get to know us, us get to know you, and grow in your faith in Jesus Christ. For those who can't stick around and for those who will be leaving later, uh, have a great 4th of July weekend. And we will see you next week. <laughs>